so yeah, let me introduce Moz. Uh, first, uh, uh, his talk is titled Accelerating Irregular Bioinformatics Algorithms on uh, GPUs. Uh, Moaz is an application performance space specialist at NERSC. His expertise includes uh, bioinformatics software development, GPU porting, optimization and performance analysis. Currently he is associated with the ExaBiom project where he contributes as a GPU application developer uh, in the metagenomics analysis software pipelines. Previously he has worked as a postdoc scholar at NERSC and LBNL uh, and and as a GP application developer at EMSL, PNNL, um, Pacific Northwest National Lab. Uh, he received his PhD in computer science from Western Michigan University under the super supervision of uh, Professor Fahad Saad in uh, 2019. His doctoral thesis explored high performance computing strategies for uh, LCMS, MS based uh, prote proteomics workflows. So, uh, Moz, you can, I guess. Start. Yeah, I, I uh, thank, thank you, Ken, for the introduction and for, for giving the opportunity to present our work. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, as Ken described, uh, my name is Moaz. I work at NERSC, uh, a division of Berkeley Lab. And uh, I'll, I'll be sharing the, the, some of the work that I've been doing with the XBind project and offloading some of the uh, irregular bioinformatics algorithms uh, to GPUs. Uh, so, uh, first, a quick outline. Uh, the, the first, I'll go uh, give a brief intro of what Exabine project is. Uh, then I'll move on to ADAPT, which is a GPU accelerated sequence and aligner that we developed and give a bit of uh, information about that. Uh, and then I'll move on to the, job, the GPU local assembly. This is one of our recent work, and, and I'll, I'll give more in depth uh, details of this. Uh, <coughs> The Exabine project is uh, is one of the projects of the, the Exascale initiative of the US Department of Energy. And uh, uh, we at NERSC have been working with some of the teams of ECP project in, uh, in preparing these applications for, for our GPU system that is provider. And this has worked nicely because most of the Exascale systems that DOE is procuring are GPU based systems. So the ESAP or the NERSC uh, collaboration with ECP teams is kind of a direct extension of uh, uh, that. So the Exabine project is, is kind of a sub set of that, and uh, the, the challenge here is that we're trying to develop uh, software solutions that can run on exascale architectures, and our problem domain is uh, uh, microbiome analysis. And for that, we, we can categorize the software tools that we're developing in roughly in three categories. Uh, the metagenome assembly, protein clustering, and, and annotation, and comparative analysis. For the scope of this talk, I'll, I'll limit my discussion to the first two columns, metagenome assembly and uh, protein clustering. Uh, if you look at the bottom uh, row uh, of the first two, or in fact all of these columns, then you'll see that the computing techniques that are being used in, uh, across these softwares that we're developing, uh, there's kind of a commonality there. For example, hash tables, alignments and camera counting are some of the software or algorithmic motifs that are kind of common there. So which allows us to generalize our approaches and implementations that we do uh, to work across all of these softwares. And again, I'll further narrow down uh, my uh, discussion for this talk uh, to these three types of problems, the short read assembly, the long read assembly, and the protein similarity clustering. Now, if you think about these problems, there are three types of uh, algorithms that are common. The, the dynamic programming alignments uh, are common across all these three domains. The distributed and local graph traversals and constructions using hash tables, here when I say graph, it's, it's mostly to point graph, that is also common across the first two, uh, while across the last two, the, uh, the sparse matrix multiplication is another motif that appears. Now, uh, I'll be more uh, in, in, in details. I'll be talking about the dynamic programming algorithm, uh, mostly attack and the district and the local hash tables uh, and local assembly uh, in detail. Now, before we get into that, let's talk about why these problems are challenging for GPU. Now, if you are a GPU developer, think about what works well for a GPU, and you will realize that it's better if you have localized and predict uh, predictable memory accessibility. 
uh, because on GPUs, uh, it's better, like the optimal way is to uh, best utilize the memory bandwidth that you have available because you have so much compute that you are limited by the memory bandwidth. So it's, uh, it's good if you have localized or at least predictable memory accesses so that you can uh, restructure your memory uh, uh, according to what your algorithm is trying to do. Uh, and then it's expected that a GPU will get more computations for each memory access, uh, and the distribution of work across the threads of a GPU is almost ideal, uh, because the, uh, then you will have the warp stalling if there is a load imbalance. But if you look at these algorithms, the sequence alignment and the hash table uh, graph traversal, then we everything we have is just opposite to that. For example. Uh, for graph traversals, the memory accept pattern is completely random because you are mostly using hash tables for that. Uh, for sequence alignment, your memory accesses are around diagonals, while typically you will have uh, the APIs that you have. The, we have like the column major or the row major indexing, and that's that's some that's somewhat easy to do because that's more common. And in bioinformatics, or in particular these algorithms, the computation that we that you're doing is mostly into your algorithm. And the combinations per memory access are quite low if you compare that to a physics or a chemistry simulation. We have a lot of floating point computations per every memory access. And thirdly, the, the amount of work uh, across every thread is non deterministic. If you're doing a, a brain graph traversal, you never know how long a certain walk is going to be. Uh, and that can cause problems because you have these lockstep uh, threads in a warp. Uh, and if you have one by doing more work, then you have a warp, the, the complete warp will be stalled. Uh, and finally, we have limited, uh, we have varying or limited amount of parallelism, because uh, when you're doing a ring graph traversal, there's only so much parallelism that you can do. And then if you look at the this, this figure on the right, which basically shows a smith waterman or a dynamic programming alignment progression, you'll see that in the yellow region, you have a diagonal of the amount of work that you can do in parallel that's increasing with every step. When you enter the orange region, it's constant, and when you enter the red region, the diagonal is shrinking. So the amount of work that you can do in parallel is decreasing, <coughs> which is just not what you want for a GPU. So as, as our first solution, we implemented ADAPT, which is a GPU accelerated sequence alignment library. And, that, and as I mentioned before, we wanted something that was generic uh, across DNA and proteins. Uh, and uh, some, something special about, about ADAPT is that it does not use typical domain-specific optimizations like uh, bit manipulation where you compress uh, uh, your, uh, your four bases of DNA to replenish it using two bits. Here we uh, use complete, I mean, we just use uh, shorts, uh, but we do not do any compression because we want uh, this to work for protein alignment as well. Uh, what we do is we rely heavily on hardware optimization. For example, we make sure that most of our communication between threads resides within a warp, where we can make use of warp intrinsic to do and do the inter-thread communication. And when we have to do inter-warp communication, we utilize shared memory and we try to minimize that. And uh, the, the biggest challenge arises when we are storing these, uh, when we are doing a trace pack and we are storing these matrices for trace pack. First, these trace pack matrices can be large. The other thing, the bigger challenge was that when you have uh, a diagonal major indexing where you, are, where you have to access uh, two elements of a diagonal, uh, you basically, if your matrix is laid out column major or a row, a row major wise, then the two consecutive elements of a diagonal will be placed length of a sequence apart. And that really makes caching difficult and causes non college memory accesses on a GPU, which basically means that you're we're doing one separate memory transaction for every thread of a war. So what we did was we restructured the way our DP matrix was laid out. We made sure that the elements of a diagonal were close by. And we do this by computing two indices on the fly. One index tells you the index of the diagonal, the other tells you the offset of element within the diagonal. And as far as the uh, the, the size of the, uh, the matrices is, con uh, is concerned, one of our PhD students recently implemented a compression strategy that allowed us to use one single bit to uh, uh, three three bits to basically uh, reflect the direction of the pointer the up left and to the diagonal uh, and that really allowed us to save about four x memory memory you know got four x memory reduction that work is still uh, being you know in the process of being right there written it will be out there soon uh, but yeah i don't really have anything any picture for that
Uh, but and, and then you did this comparison against some of the popular CPU libraries which have been vectorized and optimized much for CPUs. Uh, the analysis here is that we are trying to do a comparison between nodes, a CPU node and a, and a node that the GPUs, and uh, adapt how forms the CPU libraries by about 8x uh, up to 8x. And uh, the fun part is that we get consistent performance across uh, protein alliance as well. Typically, if you look at uh, the, some of the state of art libraries for sequence alignment out there, you'll see that they're highly optimized for DNA. And when they switch to protein, either they don't work or they do they, they see a significant performance drop. Uh, finally, we integrated adapt in MetaIPMER. MetaIPMER is our metagenome assembly pipeline. Uh, I would suggest that you just focus on this right side of the figure and do not be inundated by all the other information. So MetaHitmer is the uh, is implemented using UPC such plus, uh, which means that uh, so we are trying to optimize uh, the utilization of the node by launching as many ranks as we can. So typically, let's say if you have a front matter supercomputer on each node, we try to launch 128 ranks, and we also have four GPUs, so all the ranks will be sharing the GPU. So there's a lot of GPU sharing going on. And Adept makes it easy because we provide the software wrapper, or as we call it, driver. You basically make it's basically like you make a call to it. It will detect all the GPUs that you have available and distribute uh, the work across across all the GPUs. It's kind of a drop in replacement for a Stripe Smith Waterman library, the SSW library, or a CCAN library that you have. So you can basically re replace your API calls with the Adept call, and it will take care of that. Uh, this is some of the performance uh, comparison. Uh, let's focus on the on the on the plots within the uh, on the skyscrapers within the red box, and you can see that uh, if we have small number of nodes, for example, the red bar shows an eight node run with 11 GB meta genome data set. Uh, we're getting about 9.4x performance improvement in the alignment stage. Uh, now, being on that alignment stage, is not just the alignment kernel. There is a lot of other uh, code here as well, but Overall, it gave us 9.4 uh, performance improvement for each node runs. But as we increase the number of nodes, the amount of work that is available to do for a GPU goes drastically down. So we go up to 2x performance improvement when we are using 256 nodes and are processing 813 gigs uh, data set. These performance numbers are from some supercomputer where each node has 6 v100 GPUs. Uh, we also integrated ADAPT in PASTIS. Uh, PASTIS has a larger, uh, spent a larger percentage, percentage of time in sequence alignments, so we got a much bigger performance improvement here. And uh, uh, for example, here we got about 5x performance improvement when we moved from core CPU nodes to, to Summit Supercomputer. Uh, also, uh, uh, the, this work, uh, PASTIS using uh, ADAPT, uh, was also finalist of the Gordon Bell, for the Gordon Bell Award last year. And uh, the most of the computation uh, were being done using the ADAPT sequence alignment library there. So next is the more exciting part, the, the local assembly. And so this is a time uh, uh, pie chart for MetaHitmer uh, Meta genome assembler when doing a 64 node run on summit system. So after we have offloaded the alignment uh, parts to the GPU, this thin orange line shows you the alignment kernel that almost disappeared. And uh, the same thing that stood out was the local assembly part. It was, it was taking about 34% of the time uh, in a 64 node run. So that was literally our next target. Now, before we get into details, what is local assembly? So local assembly is the part of metagenome assembler where we try to extend context further locally by using the reads that align to each of its ends. For example, this green line is the context, and we have these reads that align to each of its ends. So in the first step, we break down all the reads into chambers, and we try to build a de Bruijn graph. And then we take the ends of the contact and try to do a de Bruijn graph traversal or a walk and try to extend the context in both the directions. But this algorithm is implemented using two steps. First is to build the de Bruijn graph using chamber hash tables. And let's say that we have these reads and we have this context, so we break down the reads into chambers and the chamber is a key, and the extent, uh, the value is the extension. For example, for this particular chamber, ATGC, the extension is A. So ATGC acts as the key, uh, the key, and the value is the extension A. 
So we build hash table in this way. And uh, once the hash table is complete, we do the annual walks or the green graph tour. So we take the slice from the end of the cortex, uh, uh, which is TDC, and we look that up in the camera hash table. We find the extension and append it to the right of the cortex. Uh, we get the next camera, we find the next extension, G, and append it to the cortex. We repeat the process over and over again till we get an acceptable walk. If the walk is not acceptable, we discard it, we go back, we read the hash table with a different camera size, and we repeat the process. Now that, now that I have described you the algorithm, think about it, what the challenges you will face when you're trying to implement this on a GPU. Uh, GPU, you do not have, first, it's, you do not have dynamic memory allocation on GPUs, and hash is a dynamic memory structure. Uh, uh, is, is, dynamic, uh, is, is a dynamic memory structure, and you will, so here obviously we'll be using these types of memory allocations. Uh, the other challenging, challenging thing is the lens of work is not deterministic, and for GPUs, you really want uh, it to be well balanced. Uh, this is an overview of the GPU local assembly. Uh, the blue parts are on CPU, the green parts are on GPU. So the first step that we do is contact bearing. This is something that brings us a certain degree of load balance across the GPU threads. Uh, how do we obtain that? Uh, because it's very difficult to know how long a certain work will be. So what we do is we try to find, uh, we try to bucket or bin the context with similar number of reads together because if you have a larger number of reads, you can expect you will have a larger hash table and you will have a longer walk. Yeah. Now, this is just a heuristic. If I'm not sure, uh, we will never hear how it was going to work, but it worked really great really for us. The next step is to estimate the hash table sizes. Now, if you go with the largest hash table size, you can only offload a handful of local assemblies uh, to GPU. But if you measure accurate number, of, uh, if you measure accurate hash table sizes for each local assembly and then allocate that specific amount to the GPU, we're able to inundate GPU with just enough work so that this very difficult looking algorithm for GPU will give you some performance. After that, we make the batches, we initialize the GPU, we offload the right extension kernel, uh, offer the left extension kernel. So these are basically the same kernel, just the data is different. We repeat till all the batches are done, and then on the G on the CPU side, we copy the, all the data back and we append the extensions to the context to the right and to the left side. This is what the, the local assembly kernel looks like from inside. Uh, the unit of parallelism that we use here is warp, and we do one local assembly per warp. The reason we use warp is because it's just a nice and right size. If you use a block, it's too much resources for a small amount of work. If you use anything less, uh, you will have uh, you will have these issues uh, that you have less number of threads. Now. It works nicely because within a warp communication is optimal. You can just use the warp in index and it's the fastest. If you have to do inter warp, then you have to go through shared memory, global memory, and that really slows things down. So using a warp, we construct a hash table, uh, that's the chain hash table, and then using just one thread of the warp, we do the graph traverse. Uh, because there's only so much parallelism there, so we just use one thread there. Next, we do a broadcast of how the warp went, because only one thread knows if the warp was successful or it was a failure, because if it's success, then you go through, if, it's fa if it has failed, then you go back and rebuild the hash table with all the other threads together. Uh, that's why the broadcast is important, and uh, uh, yeah, if you don't, then uh, some of the threads will go through, and one thread will be one there. So here we use the war in physics to do the broadcast. Uh, there were a lot of uh, interesting things when we were implementing this, but here I'll, try, I'll, I'll just mention one. The thing that I found most interesting, that was the type of collisions that we ran into. One was the hash collisions. Hash collisions are the typical hash collisions that you have the same hash uh, for two insertions. So here you uh, be resolved using the linear probing approach. The other thing was thread collision. That was more interesting. A thread collision is when you have two threads uh, that end up having the same camera. For example, here, thread one and four have the same camera, so they would be accessing the same memory in the hash table. On the, on the CPU, you would have these nice atomic regions that are exclusive regions that you will have, and you can do this thing sequentially. But on GPUs, since we have lockstep execution, it, it becomes very difficult. So the, uh, what we did was we used QRS uh, uh, in like uh, atomic CAS, compared to swap function, and pair it with the match and sync operator. So what match and sync does is it tells you uh, if a certain uh, how, uh, if if a pointer is sharing the same value across uh, across multiple threads in a warp. 
For example, the Atari two threads in a warp, if two threads are sharing the same point value in the warp, it will give you the bits uh, of those in the form of a mass. And that tells you which of the two threads are running into this thread collision, and then you can uh, use uh, atomic cast in a very targeted manner and resolve this. This basically mimics an atomic region, but in a very performant way. Uh, the difference between you, uh, you know, not using this and doing a typical lock uh, thing, it was about 20x performance difference. Uh, finally, we integrated local assembly into MetaHit in a very similar way we did with the uh, adapt. But since local assembly kernel is slower than the sequence aligning kernel, uh, it, it's taking, uh, you know, spend a lot of time on GPUs, so we also introduced CPU stealing, where we have a queue of work, GPU takes a chunk, and CPU starts stealing work from there while GPU is busy. So it really gave us the best of both worlds. Uh, finally, this is the uh, final view uh, of 64 neutron that I showed you in the beginning. You can see that we reduced the local assembly part to just 6.3 percent of the total uh, runtime of energy on uh, assembler. And this is a strong scaling plot. Uh, you can see that as we increase the number of nodes, the amount of work that is available per GPU goes down, so the speed of uh, suffers. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it works. It still it works nicely. It's not what we expected, but if you think about the type of algorithm it is, it's really doing uh, doing a good job for us. Uh, this was uh, this was a eight GB dataset run on summit nodes. And uh, one thing that you can see here is that local assembly uh, gives more consistent performance uh, consistent performance improvement if we do a type of weak scaling. But if you look at the alignment code, uh, the weak scaling wasn't really good because uh, there was less work to do. I wouldn't really say less work to do per GPU, but the alignment kernel is way faster than the local assembly kernel is uh, given you know, the same amount of data uh, input. Uh, but uh, yeah, we did get a decent amount of performance improvement. Now, uh, everything that we implemented so far was in CUDA, and if you have been keeping up with the US uh, HPC infrastructure, uh, you'll know that uh, all the exascale, the, the current and the upcoming exascale supercomputers are, do not have NVIDIA devices. They have uh, AMD or Intel GPUs. And uh, so that means we have a lot of work to do. So for Frontier, we currently we have a HIP port. HIP is uh, a kind of an analog to CUDA, very similar. If you know CUDA, you know HIP, you can easily port your code to uh, HIP. But the challenge that we faced here was that some of the intrinsics, in fact, a lot of intrinsics that we were using in CUDA are not completely supported in HIP. So sometimes we had to implement something on our own, or sometimes we had to uh, implement you know, a completely different algorithmic approach. For example, the match and the sync example that I showed, you can't do that on HIP or on AMD devices. You have to do something different. And uh, the other thing that we're considering is that within the DOE circle, there is uh, a lot of effort going on in, in supporting multiple backends and runtimes. Uh, for example, if your GPU supports a Spear V, uh, then there is something known as chip SPV, and that allows your CUDA and HIP code to run on Intel GPUs. Um, so yeah, we are looking into some solutions of those style, uh, because we really don't want to maintain a third type of code that is of SQL code. We already have a CUDA and a HIP code. Uh, having SQL, which SQL is slightly more different than HIP and CUDA, so it will require more, require more effort. Uh, maybe at another talk, at another venue, I can talk more about our porting efforts and performance and portability efforts that we have, we have for the same problems. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, my team at Exabiome, at NERSC, and the, the funding agencies and the institutes. Uh, and, uh, thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. I hope I finished my time. Thanks. I guess we have some time for questions. Uh, one question. Hello, Omar. Thank you very much for the great talk. Very interesting works. I would like to ask you something about ADEPT, uh, the way that you paralyze. Um, if, I, if I got it correct, I mean, uh, you explain that you kind of rotate the dynamic programming matrix by 45 degrees, right, in order to have coalesced memory accesses. You also mentioned that you partition the different sections, different parts of the matrix uh, over different warps. Um, 
So what is not clear to me is uh, how do you transition from anti-diagonal to anti-diagonal? Is that you just terminate a kernel and launch a new kernel, or you synchronize using some atomic operations or something? I'm curious about that. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. Maybe yeah, I, I was not clear enough. I think here. So the thing is that we use one uh, one thread to compute one column of the of the matrix. Uh, and uh, typically, if you have any, you know, because uh, you will be needing information from two other threads. So let's say if you're computing this particular cell, you will be needing information from the thread on your left. So that communication is done using one. So basically, there is no uh, synchronization there explicitly. Okay, so you communicate using shuffle instructions, I guess. Yeah, that's right. But if you have communication over here, like between two warps, then that happens with, through a shared memory. And sometimes when you enter these red regions, where the thread on your left may have spaced out because it completed its its column, oh. then before it goes out of phase, it uh, leaks its uh, uh, registers or spills its registers to shared shared memory. Uh -huh. Okay, I understand. And then so then it's one alignment per thread block, I guess. Oh, okay, yeah, that, that's right. So there's one alignment per thread block, that, that's correct. So, yeah, we have uh, a lot of alignments happening in parallel, yeah, as many pro uh, blocks that we can launch given the resources. Okay, okay, yeah, understood. Thank you very much. Good work. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Moaz. Uh, this is Mohammed Alsar, ETH. So, uh, for the three uh, bit optimization you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. is it similar to CDEX? from micro 2020 or like this is something else? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the reference that you mentioned. I can maybe tell a bit about it. So three bits, it's a problem for alignment. So typically we are using four bits, but by three bits, uh, you know, one points in the up direction, one points to the left, one to the diagonal. So to keep track of uh, your trace back matrices, uh, so uh, she, uh, like our Peter to the end, she is using those three bits uh, you know, building metrics where yeah, you can keep track of that pointers. I see, I see. Right. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Hopefully you'll see that work you know, somewhere soon that she's in the process of publishing it. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So maybe I have like uh, one more question, but like this is more or less like uh, Maybe we two type question. Uh, mm -hmm. So you mentioned like the, the I guess you worked on different graphs, uh, and like naturally you also observed that there's probably like uh, potentially a less problem over there. At least like the, by the nature of the algorithm, or at least as compared to string graphs. I guess I then also worked on uh, on the distributed memory using string graphs to construct assembly with Julia and others. Uh, I was wondering whether there was an insight uh, behind using the Bruin graphs uh, rather than string graphs, let's say, which I guess provides a better parallelism for GPUs, or did you just want to extend this, extend the GPUs for this application particularly? So yeah, uh, so I think you just answered the question, yeah. So basically, metagenome assembler is like kind of an established application, it is being used by community. And our effort here was to not to mess with the algorithms or you know try to change that. We just wanted to get it working on something that had GPUs and utilize that. So uh, I think somebody who developed a metagenome assembler or you know initially or who thought about you know when did making this decision of either to use those string graphs or the brain graph, maybe they, they would be in a better position to answer that. Uh, yeah. I, I I remember having that discussion with them, but I don't really recall what the reasoning was. But yeah, I, I agree there there can be a better solution to that. Okay. Okay. And let's thank Moz again.